So Olivia Borgi, who uses she, her pronouns, is a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Before attending Melbourne, she received her master's in pure mathematics from the University of Washington in Seattle, USA. Olivia's research interests are in homotopy theory, specifically in higher operads and mon monoidal categories, as well as how they connect to quantum algebra. She is now and always a vocal advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion in mathematics. So go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Olivia. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for putting on this lovely event. It's like truly an honor to be invited to speak here. Um, I'm talking here from Melbourne, Australia. So I'm all the way on the other side of the globe from y'all. It is tomorrow morning for me. I am also slightly under the weather. So if I have to cough or drink water or lose my voice, this is why. Just bear with me. Um, this has been a particularly difficult year for a lot of us in this community as queer mathematicians. Um, and that's part of why I think events like this are so important uh, to help us foster a strong professional and social community of queer mathematicians, as I think we all need each other. Um, the name of my talk is G monoidal categories. My research is specifically in G monoidal infinity categories, but I wanted this talk to be as accessible as possible to as wide an audience of mathematicians as possible. So I'm gonna be focusing on the one categorical setting. Uh, and then if there's some time permitting at the end, I'll get into some infinity category stuff for those who are interested. Um, okay, so the idea of a G minute category is that this is a category uh, which has a notion of tensor product, meaning that if I have two objects, A and B, I have some object, A tensor B, and specifically, we would like there to be commutativity isomorphisms uh, relating A tensor B to B tensor A. And I wanna associate these isomorphisms to group elements from some group G. Uh, so I've drawn this diagram here to give you an idea of how this might work. I have A tensor B here being related to B tensor A via an isomorphism G. I then have the same idea here uh, B tensor A being related to A tensor B via an isomorphism H. And then the idea is that if I compose these isomorphisms, then I have some isomorphism relating A tensor B to itself. And this is being associated to the group product of these two group elements. Um, but in order to get to an actual definition of these things, we're gonna have to go through some preliminary material to start with uh, what is a monoidal category? So a monoidal category is a category C equipped with a functor of this form like this. Um, we usually write mu for this. And the idea is that mu of two objects, A comma B, uh, rather other way, is that tensor product A tensor B. And we would like this to be uh, unital and associative but we would also like to be good category theorists, which means that we're only gonna require these things be unital and associative up to an isomorphism. Uh, so specifically, this means that there's some unit object, which we can call one, uh, and one tensor A is isomorphic to A is isomorphic to A tensor one. Uh, similarly, we want associativity to hold up to isomorphism. This uh, information is usually packaged in a couple of diagrams called the triangle and pentagon diagrams. Uh, I'm not going to draw them here. They take up a lot of space. They're kind of hard to understand. And it's fairly easy to understand that they're unital and associative, but only up to isomorphism. So the first and sort of central example of a G monodal category is when G is the symmetric groups. Uh, and in this case, <coughs> excuse me. And in this case, our uh, commutativity isomorphisms are actually unique. There's one of them. So I've drawn that diagram that I drew before, but now for the symmetric case. And in this case, I have an isomorphism relating A tensor B to B tensor A. It is unique, but it is also associated to the non-trivial element of the second symmetric group. Uh, so just the one that sends 0, 1 to 1, 0, if you want. Similarly, I have an isomorphism relating B tensor A to A tensor B. It is also associated to this non-trivial element of the second symmetric group. Now, if I take the group product of that element with itself, it's its own inverse. And so I end up getting out the identity in that group. 
Similarly, if I compose these two arrows, I get out the identity arrow pointing A tensor B to itself. And so you can think of this as the commutativity isomorphism being its own inverse. So there are tons of examples of symmetric monodal categories. Uh, most classical examples of monodal categories are symmetric, including the category of vector spaces with its normal tensor product, the category of sets with the Cartesian product, the category of groups with its Cartesian product. And there are plenty of these things. But there are more complicated examples of G monodal categories. And the other sort of classical example would be when G is the braid groups. And these are called braided monodal categories. So I've once again redrawn this diagram that I had before. But now, instead of having a unique commutativity isomorphism pointing any permutation of tensor products of objects to another, I have commutativity isomorphisms that are associated to group elements from the braid group, specifically in this example, the second braid group. So I've drawn them here. Uh, oops. That is the eraser, not the laser pointer. Uh, I've drawn them here. Uh, instead of writing down a group element, I've drawn a braid diagram because I think that's a little easier to parse. And so this first commutativity isomorphism is related to this braid here. It's the braid where I just take the first strand and I wrap it over the second. I'm going to do the same thing for the second isomorphism here. This is going to be the isomorphism associated to that braid where the first strand goes over the second. And now if I take the group product of those two braids, I don't get the identity element this time. No braid is its own inverse. I can always just keep twisting around and around and around. So in this sense, uh, what I end up getting out instead of an identity arrow pointing A tensor B to A tensor B is an isomorphism uh, associated to this sort of double twisting braid that I've drawn here. OK. So examples of braided monodal categories include any symmetric monodal category. Um, they're sort of like strict versions of braided monodal categories. And I will go into more detail as to how exactly we can see them as braided monodal categories a little later. But the other sort of classical example is the category of graded modules over some ring. Uh, this is with its normal tensor product. One moment. <laughs> But the commutativity isomorphisms, the idea is that in order to point A tensor B to B tensor A, I take an element X tensor Y, and I point it to something that looks like this, where U here is an invertible element of our ring or of our module. Um, and the idea here is that if this thing isn't its own inverse, when I iterate over this thing, I'm not going to get out the identity unless it is its own inverse. And so I'm going to get a sort of non-trivial braiding, a non-symmetric braiding, just when u squared is not equal to 1. OK. So up to this point, I've been kind of vague about what exactly g is. Uh, it seems to be some groups. They seem to have some notion of permutation. What these things actually are is something called an action operad. And now an action operad, uh, it's a lot of data. But in particular, it is a sequence of groups, g, n a sequence of group homomorphisms pointing down to the symmetric groups, pi n. And this information needs to assemble into something called the parenthesized G operad, or PAG. If you haven't seen operads before, I'm going to do my best to motivate this without using the exact definition of an operad. If you have seen them before, this is an operad in the category of categories, specifically where each uh, level is a groupoid. Um, OK, so what is PAG exactly? Again, it's a sequence of categories now, uh, PAGN. Each of these categories is a groupoid, meaning that it only has isomorphisms. All arrows are isomorphisms. And then the idea with an operat is, if I have an object in PAGN, which is sort of the nth level of this sequence of categories, then I want to be able to plug in objects from other levels of this thing to each of its n slots, if you will. And that's what this information here, this functor, is showing. I have PAGN. So think of an object in this thing. I'm plugging in an object from PAGK1 to the first slot, PAGKN to the nth slot. 
And then if I sum over the ki's and it's equal to k, this is then going to point out an object in p a g k. Um, so that's all very abstract and not very visual. I've just written down a functor. So in order to understand this a little better, we're going to dive into what exactly p a g is. OK. So how is each groupoid of this opera defined, p a g n? Uh, so in order to do that, we're going to look at the example of p a g 4. Uh, the objects of this groupoid are parenthesized permutations of length four. What that means specifically is something that looks like this here. It is a choice of permutation, in this case, one, three, four, two, which I've expressed here as x1, x3, x4, x2, and a choice of parenthesization. Uh, so the idea with the parenthesization is that it should tell you an order in which we are multiplying these things together. And so if I have an object in P, A, G, N, I would need a set of N minus two parentheses. In the case of P, A, G, four here, I have two parentheses. So I have an object here, X1, X3, X4, X2, parenthesized in this manner, which is again telling us what order we want to multiply something in. I have an object here, which is the permutation x2, x4, x3, x1, parenthesized in this manner. And there's going to be an isomorphism between these two objects in the groupoid PAG4 just when I have an element g in the group g4 such that pi4 of g sort of corroborates the underlying permutations of these things meaning that it is the symmetric group element in the fourth symmetric group that points 1, 3, 4, 2 to 2, 4, 3, 1. So again, pi 4 was part of the data of an action operad. I have a sequence of groups and a sequence of group homomorphisms. So these are where my isomorphisms come from. G is in G4, just when pi 4 of G corroborates the underlying permutations of my objects in P A G 4. Um, the operatic composition in PAG is defined differently for each choice of G. So this functor gamma that I've written up here is going to look different for each choice of G. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm going to show two different examples of how this operatic composition is defined. The first of which is for the parenthesized symmetry operad PA sigma. Uh, this is the operad that's built using the symmetric groups. The idea with P A sigma is that once again, as with all PAGs, my objects are these parenthesized permutations. But now I have a unique isomorphism between any two objects in this. OK. So I have an object here. Oops. I have an object here. I have an object here. I have the unique isomorphism between these. And the operatic composition, again, is some notion of plugging in some other element to some slot of this thing. And so I'd like to be able to plug in, say, the third slot, some uh, morphism in P A sigma 2. In this case, it's the unique isomorphism pointing x2, x1 to x1, x2. OK, so in order to do this, the idea is I'm going to take the variable here that's in the third slot, which is x4, I'm going to replace it with this entire thing, but I'm going to re-index appropriately. So in this case, uh, I'm replacing x4 with x5, x4, because what I'm replacing it with was this x2, x1. Uh, here it's x4. We want to think of that as like the smallest number, and that's where the re-indexing comes from. Since I'm adding more variables into this parenthesized permutation, I'm going to need more parentheses. And the solution is rather simple. We're just going to put parentheses around whatever we're plugging in. So that's where these two uh, blue parentheses come from. Excuse me, one moment. OK, so once again, with um, P A sigma, at least, there's a unique isomorphism between any two objects. And so at least on the level of operatic composition, I don't need to worry about these isomorphisms. There's a unique one. That's the one that it composes to. Um, on the bottom here, I do need to replace x4 once again 
But now it's going to be uh, corroborating the underlying order of that target object there. So in this case, it'll be x4, x5, rather than x5, x4, as it was up there. OK, so let's look at a more complicated example, uh, specifically for PAB, the parenthesized grade operab. Um, I've drawn the same objects here. But now there's no longer a unique isomorphism pointing one object to another. Instead, we're going to have an element of, in this case, the fourth braid group that corroborates the underlying permutations of these things. What that ends up looking like, if I draw it in braid diagrams, is something like this, where I have a braid, and then the strands sort of point uh, one variable to itself wherever it ends up on the object below. So I have a strand here pointing x1 to itself x3 to itself, x2 to itself, x4 to itself. So once again, I want to be able to sort of plug in uh, a morphism from some other level groupoid in this operad to some slot of this isomorphism, specifically in this case, the third slot. Um, so what we're going to do is a process that's called cabling. On the level of objects, it's going to look identical to how I did it for the parenthesized symmetry operad, which was just sort of plugging in these objects and re-indexing them. So that's what we've done here. It looks identical to how I did it before. But now, uh, in order to change the isomorphism between these two things, the idea is I'm taking this strand, pointing x4 to itself, and I'm replacing it with this entire braid. So you can see that here. OK. So with these two examples of PAG operads under our belt, we can actually get to a definition of G-monodal category. I've written down two here, actually, um, the first of which is the one that we're going into detail on. Uh, it's that a G-monodal category is an algebra over this parenthesized G operad. This is a definition from Donald Yao in his book, Operads with Group Equivariance. And it's uh, the one we're going to be going into more detail about. I've written another one here because it's my own definition. Uh, this is a more useful definition for when we're pushing to the sort of infinity category setting. But it's that a G monodal category is a discrete two op vibration over the two category G groupoid that satisfies a certain Siegel condition. I will only go into some detail on this if there's time permitting at the end. For now, we're going to focus on Donald Yao's definition uh, and make sense of what is even an algebra over an opera. OK. So before, when I was describing PAG, I said it was uh, an opera in the category of categories. So an algebra from this uh, over this opera should also be an object in the category of categories, a category. So that's a good start. <laughs> Um, and this category needs to come equipped with sort of structure maps. And these structure maps look something like this, omega n, where we have the nth groupoid from this operad, the Cartesian product with c to the nth power, and then a functor all the way down to c. This needs to satisfy uh, several things, including uh, symmetric equivariance stuff and uh, associativity condition. We're not going to go into too much detail about algebras over operads. Instead, we're going to try to make sense of why this functor could give us exactly what we're looking for. So if I look at the image uh, of x1, x2, comma a, comma b under omega 2, this is exactly how I'm going to define my monoidal product. So earlier, I said a monoidal category is something equipped with this uh, as a category equipped with this sort of functor like this from c squared to itself or to c rather. And that's exactly what this is giving us here. If I look at omega 2 of x1, x2, and then leave these two slots blank, then that is a functor from c squared to c. And so that's exactly how we're going to define our monoidal product. The image of a and b under that functor is a tensor b. Similarly, if I look at the image of x2, x1, which is an object in the second level of this operad with a and b, what I'm going to get is b tensor a. And then if I have an isomorphism in this uh, operad pointing x1, x2 to x2, x1 and associated to an, a group element g, 
what I end up getting out on the other side of things is exactly what I'm looking for, which is this commutativity isomorphism uh, associated to a group element G. So we can do the same thing and build that same diagram I've been drawing for uh, G in the middle categories up to this point, where I have H pointing X2, X1 to X1, X2 in uh, PAG2 in this example. And if I look at the image here, I get the commutativity isomorphism H. And then because of the functoriality of all of this, we get exactly what I was looking for, which is that the composition of this will be the isomorphism associated to the group product of those two things. OK. So to make a bit more sense of that, I've drawn an example with braids. If we look at the image of this blue braid here uh, under the uh, omega 4 functor with, say, a list of objects A, B, C, D, what I'm going to get out is an isomorphism from A tensor C tensor D tensor B parenthesized in this way, meaning multiplied in this order to C tensor B tensor A tensor D parenthesized in that way, meaning multiplied in that order. And if you look closely at these braids, the purple braid here is actually the inverse of this blue braid here. You can just sort of unwind these braids. And what this means is that these two commutativity isomorphisms, when I compose them, are just going to give me the identity on A tensor C tensor D tensor B parenthesized in this manner. OK. So a while back in my talk, I briefly mentioned that all symmetric monodal categories are braided monodal categories. And one way we can make sense of this is by looking at this sort of algebra over an opera definition for them. So uh, the horizontal arrow I have here in this diagram is just the structure map associated to a symmetric monodal category C. There's an obvious map of operads from the parenthesized braid operad to the parenthesized symmetry operad. And it comes from these group homomorphisms pi n, which were part of the data of an action operad. So that constructs into an entire map of operads, which means that on each level for each groupoid and each of these structure maps, I have a diagram that looks something like this. Oops. Oh, no, we're good. I have a diagram that looks something like this. And then what is happening here is that this composition defines a braided monoidal structure on C. So this map, this uh, diagonal map, is giving us the braided monoidal structure on a symmetric monoidal category. OK, so some less popular examples of G monoidal categories um, include uh, G when it is the cactus groups. And this is what originally uh, piqued my interest in this subject is um, there's this concept called a co-boundary category. Specifically, uh, if you look at the category of representations over a quantum group, it is a co-boundary category. I wanted to show that this was uh, a category that had an action of the cactus groups on iterated mineral products. It turns out that Donald Yao had already shown this, and he used this whole theory of G-monodal categories to do so. And so the, the example of the quintessential example of a cactus monoidal category is the category of representations over a quantum group. This category is actually also a braided monoidal category. And I will go into more detail on that in just a moment. There are further examples of G monoidal categories, including when G is the ribbon braid groups. And ribbon braid monoidal categories show up in the work of Natalie Vall, specifically. Uh, as double loop spaces on S1 spaces, which is a whole nother subject, so we're not going to get into it. OK, here's my brief aside about quantum algebra. So it turns out there are no actual operad maps between the parenthesized cactus operad and the parenthesized braid operad. Uh, there's no way to map all of the cactus groups to the braid groups. You just can't do it. But it turns out that there's this process of completion of operads and groupoids. And if we do that to the parenthesized braid operad, then we actually do get a map of operads from PAC to the completed parenthesized braid operad, which I've written down here as PAB hat. What this means is that if I have a braided monoidal category that is uh, 
also a completed braided monoidal category in the sense that it is an algebra over this completed parenthesized braid off rod, then it too is a co-boundary category or a cactus monoidal category. So this functor from completed braided monoidal categories or PAB hat algebras to co-boundary categories or PAC algebras is called unitarization. Um, and in the case of the category of representations over a quantum group, what it does is it point, it takes that category with its completed braided monoidal structure and it points out its co-boundary structure instead. Um, how are we doing on time? Not great for infinity stuff, but uh, I do want to briefly say uh, a moment about this, uh, just because this is what my work is on. There was already in the literature a definition for a symmetric monoidal infinity category. And it is as a co-Cartesian fibration of simplicial sets over the nerve of finite pointed sets. What I did is I constructed a uh, two category G groupoid uh, associated to an action opera G. Um, and then if I take the nerve of that two category, specifically something called the Duskin nerve, which is a two categorical construction, I get out a quasi category G O times, which allows me to define a G monoidal infinity category as a co Cartesian vibration over this uh, quasi category G O times. Uh, so this definition is somewhat identical to the symmetric case. We're just replacing the nerve of finite pointed sets with uh, what is equivalent to an action opera. Um, so GO times. And I think that's just about it because I will not have enough time to explain this diagram here. So instead, I'm going to say thank you uh, so much for having me. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them.